Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Epic Life Church. We're so grateful you've chosen to spend part of your weekend with us, whether you're online or in person. We'd like to take a moment and share some things you need to know about here at Epic Life. If this is your first time with us today, we certainly hope you'll consider making Epic Life your church home. Also, be sure to fill out the communication card you received on your way into the worship gathering today. And after today's service, drop it off at any of our drop boxes located in Kids Nation, Guest Central, or near the door as you exit the worship gathering. Hey guys, I've got one more note about those communication cards. Whether this is your first week at Epic Life Church or you've been coming for years, we need you to fill out those cards. This is how we make sure that we keep your information correct and how we know how best to pray for you every week. So fill out those cards for us. Thanks. If you're visiting us online, you can also text the word WELCOME to 972-210-7125. And we thank you so much for worshiping with us today. If you'd like to follow along with today's notes from the message, consider downloading the Version Bible app where you'll find today's gathering by opening the menu and selecting events. Here at Epic Life, we believe giving is an important act of worship for every believer, and we want to make it as simple, safe, and secure as possible using these four ways to give. You can give traditionally by placing a gift in an envelope located in the seat backs in front of you and dropping it off in the drop boxes located around the building. You can give online by going to our website, epiclifetarot.com forward slash give. You can download and use the Church Center app, or you can give by texting the word GIVE, followed by the amount, to 84321. We want to thank you again for choosing to spend your Sunday with us, and we hope this message will be encouraging and inspiring to you. Have a blessed day, Epic Life. It's that time of year again to cool off at Splash Kingdom for Splash 21. Splash 21! Woo! Attend our weekend worship service, August 29th, and you and your family can get into Splash Kingdom in Greenville for free. The entire park will be reserved for three hours of summer fun. Oh, we're going down! <laughs> those who want to enter the park will receive a wristband after service, and only those with a valid Splash 21 wristband will be able to enter the park. Yeah! <laughs> The event will start at 6.30 and will be over at 9.30. Let's celebrate the end of summer together with some fun in the sun. Splash 21. Join us August 29th for one last summer celebration. Visit Splash.Family for more information. Excuse me, can anyone help me? Can I get another one of these, please? Man, make plans to do that this week, uh, Mr. Dustin will have some more information to you about that. But that's our final uh, summer event. We do summer events uh, just to help keep our families and everybody connected uh, during the summer break. And we know that everybody's going on vacations and everybody's scattered. And uh, some of you that didn't get vacation, I feel you. Okay, I feel you. Praise God, because I know what you're going through, right? Um, but praise God. So we are in a, uh, man, a, a really mess, a message that I'm excited about because it's, it, the message title is called blessed. And what we're doing is we're looking at areas in the Bible where God said that if you'll do A, he'll do B. Amen. How many of y'all like to, when God does B? Come on, somebody, right? How many of y'all don't like when you got to do A? Come on, let's be honest today, right? Come on, right? And, and what we're talking about are some of the promises that God puts in scripture. And, uh, and one of the things that I've, I've, I've been mentioning before, and, and yet no one's been able to show it other than salvation, I understand. But even in salvation, there are things that we have to do. But with every condition or every promise that God gives us in Scripture, there is always a condition. There's always a God saying, I want to bless you, but in order for me to bless you, you have to do this. Even salvation, as much of a blessing that salvation is, we tell people there's nothing you have to do to be saved. And we know now that that's not true. That really, we've got to give our life over to the Lord, right? Jesus said, unless you pick up your cross and follow me... Uh, you can't follow me. Jesus said that if, uh, if you don't leave willing to leave your mother, your father, your son, your daughter, you're not will, uh, able to go to the kingdom of God. And Jesus, wasn't, Jesus was not advocating leaving your family, okay? That's not what he was doing. He was telling us the position that he had to be in our life so that we'd have the salvation. Salvation is a free gift 
from the Father. It is done by faith, through grace, uh, lest any one of us can boast. But there's still something we have to do in order to follow Christ. But what I wanted to do through this series is look at areas. There's three major areas that I feel like, uh, as a pastor, that I see people come to church and they'll sit on my uh, couch and they'll say, man, I'm having this issue and we're dealing with it. So in week, this is week two of that series. And we want to truly look at this word blessed. We kind of defined it last week. Um, so if you missed last Sunday, let me encourage you, go online to our website. Uh, it's Epic Life Carol forward slash media. And uh, on the media tab, you can go there and see all of our messages and uh, catch up. So last week, we talked about my obedience. And I know that's a word we don't like to hear in church because it's not seeker friendly. Praise God. I get it. Uh, but if we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14. And, and in that passage, it kicks right off with God saying, if you want to do, if you'll do this, if you'll obey my commands, I'm going to bless you. And not only does he do that, but if you read the context of 14, uh, verse uh, 1 through 14, you'll see about 12 areas. Look at your neighbor and say 12. 12 areas of your life that he wants to bless. Simply by making the decision to say, I'm going to put God first and I'm going to obey him. And I know sometimes that's not, it's not a seeker-friendly message when we start talking about that. Now, who doesn't want God's blessing on their life? Thank you for not raising your hand. Praise God. I thought maybe one person would go, you know, there'd be like one person might jump up there and, and do that. So we wanted to talk about understanding what it means to have the Father's hand on us. See, that's what Scripture really deals with. When we talk about a blessing, what we're talking about is God's hand on something that you do. Okay? So we live in America, and up until about now... Um, the Bible promises to, the, to, to Abraham, all of our father, um, and in Abraham, God made a covenant with him, and a covenant means it's forever, it never ends, okay? And the covenant to Abraham, that God made a promise to this Abraham, he said, Abraham, whoever blesses you, I will bless. And ever, whoever curses you, Abraham, I will become a curse to. Now, for up until about this time, the United States, America, praise God, have always been pro-supporters of the nation of Israel. And what has happened? We've had God's hand on us. He has blessed our country. He has blessed us in any other way. We're one of the strongest, not the, but we are one of the strongest nations in the world. And it didn't happen because we were some smart people, okay? Praise God. Come on now. I know some of y'all. Y'all know me, right? So the idea was that God blessed us, not because of anything we did, but because of what he, because we, we, we did support the nation of Israel. And God says, this is what I'm going to do. Now what we're seeing, and you know it, it's not, it doesn't take a rocket. I am not the sharpest tool in the shed, okay? And you know and I know that God's hand, you can feel it, you can see it in our country, where his hand is being removed. The blessing of God is being removed. But let me tell you a secret. All right, y'all ready for this? No matter how much God takes his hand off this nation, guess what his hand won't come off of? His people. His people. See, you, do you understand that you can be blessed even though everybody around you is not? I love that. We talked about that last week, how important it is that our obedience, man, the impact of our obedience. Now today, we're going to look at another area. We're going to look at an area that a lot of people don't want to talk about, especially in church. Because then you get on the, you know, well, all the pastors, all they want is my money. See, you already know the message. Praise God. Look at that. Y'all must be looking online. That's right. All we talk about is money. Well, not true. If you come to Epic Life Church, I only do a couple of messages a year on finances. But it's also one of the biggest struggles that men and women deal with, and that's finances. They deal with it all the time. We're all in this room or in this together. Right? Matter of fact... Here's something that, um, that we're going to talk about this area that hands down statistically, it is the most talked about or thought about subject in human beings. There's only two areas in a, st in a study that was done. There's only two areas that people think about all the time. Number one is money. Number two is their job. Oh, I know what y'all are thinking, right? Yeah, I know. No, no, that's number three. Okay, that's number three. All right, all right. But, it, but it, this is the topic. Finances, we think about... Are, is there any little people in here? I'm going to make sure there's no little people. Okay. So we think... You are not little, brother. Praise <laughs> God. You haven't been little since you were nine years old, man. Come on. Praise God. All right. Look, we think about this more than sex. And I know some of y'all think, well, Pastor Mike, no, I know you do. 
Be- <laughs> Praise God. He said, I've been listening to that fake news. Praise God. <laughs> That's awesome. But it is. It is that one area that we think about. Because we're either thinking about at our job how to get that promotion and how to do better in our finances, or we're at home fighting with our spouse about money. And we can't go on vacation because we can't afford it. Or we can't get the new suit or the new car or the new house or the new whatever because we can't afford it. We fear finances bigger than anything. I tell people this, that unless God was involved, we are all one paycheck away from being homeless. Because most of us will agree, that's where we're at. That's our life. It's the way we are. But, how, but there is a way that God says, I'm going to bless you. I want God's hand on my finances. How many would say that's a good place for God to be? Right? Now, I've talked to people. I've heard stories about how amazing God has when we do these areas in our life. All right? Now, it's not enough to just know what the Father says. Okay? It's not enough. But as I get ready to get into this, it's not enough to just know what God says about a particular area. Knowing about something will not bless you. Listen to me. Watch this. God rewards us for what we do, not for what we believe. You need to get that in your spirit this morning. God does not reward us for what we know. We don't get to go to heaven because we know of Jesus. We go to heaven because we know who Jesus is. We know him. If you want to know more about that, we've been talking about that on Wednesday nights. To know it's an intimacy. You know, the hardest words, I shared this on on Wednesday night, I said, the hardest words that any person can hear is when they're standing before our Lord and Savior on their day of accountability. And he says to us, or one of us, Depart from me, you doers of iniquity, for I've never known you. That can be the hardest thing to hear. And here's the, here's the truth of it. There are men and women in this room today. There are men and women online today. Listen to me. This is a, if I can tell you something as your pastor, listen to me. You're going to hear those words. And we think that coming to church because we know of Yeshua. Or because we know of God's Bible. Or we even know of some of His promises. But God does not reward us for what we know. God rewards us for what we do. And that's what this really, this whole message series is about. And it's a short one, actually. God rewards us for what we do, not what we believe. For every promise that God gave us is based on what we do, not what you and I believe. There's conditions attached to every one of his promises. They're beautiful. Matter of fact, guys, you want to hear a promise that's so cool? Especially you young men that are dating. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, it says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And watch, receives favor from the Lord. How many of y'all men need a little favor today? Praise God. Come on. All right, the other ones I'll be praying for. Y'all need some, okay? Well, right there, that's the promise of God. He says the condition is find a good wife. The promise is you'll have favor. I found a good wife. Praise God. Yeah, she, she was able to deal with me for 30 years. Lucky her. Praise God. Right, y'all only have to deal with me for an hour. She lives with me. I know, right? Pray for her. Praise God. But God is faithful to do what he says he will do. This is the thing. We expect that. We expect God to say, God, you said you would do this. I'm expecting you to do this. But what about us? What about the flip side of that script? Are we willing to expect ourselves to do what God said to do? I hope so, because that's the promise. That's where the blessing is. That's where life happens. That's where God wants to do something in your life. But we say, well, God, your word promises. Yeah, my word promises, but it also says this. And that's what we've been looking at over the series called Blessed. In Christ, the Bible says all of the promises in your relationship with Jesus, according to 1 Corinthians, it says that all the promises are yes and amen. Now, let me break that down for a minute for you guys that are new to our church. When I say all the promises of Christ are yes, or all the promises of God are yes and amen. That means all the promises of God are yes and amen. All right, you didn't get that this morning. All the promises. Well, what promises? There are three major covenants that God has made with mankind. Every one of those covenants you have access to because you have chosen to follow Jesus and because you're grafted into the nation of Israel. That's beautiful, man. Every promise. The promise made to Abraham is for... It even says that in there. This will be a covenant for all generations. The covenant's made to David. The covenant made to and through 
Yeshua. All of the promises are yes and amen. So when you see a promise in Scripture, the condition is it is yours if you're grafted in. If you have a relationship with the Father, you're grafted in and it says this promise is for you. So let's look at one of those promises today as we unpack this idea of some of the promises. See, the truest form of spiritual maturity comes when we understand what it means, here we go, to be generous. It's not about how much knowledge you have, but how generous you are. Matter of fact, in the Hebrew covenant, let's actually read our verse for 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. It says, command those who are rich. Now stop right there for a minute, because I'm going to use a word that you guys will probably, some of y'all have already disconnected from, right? Because you're saying, I'm not rich. How many would say you're not rich? In the, come on, let's be honest tonight. I'm not rich. Okay. I love that. I love this. All right. Statistically, if you have one car, one vehicle, you are of the richest 1% in the world. How many of y'all got two cars? No, don't raise your hand because I don't want to like, I'm, yeah, raise your hand. I got two cars. Come on, somebody. You got a two cars? You got a car we don't know? Oh, they got two cars. Oh, okay, we got it. <laughs> praise the Lord. All right, man. <laughs> oh, my boy. Praise the Lord. Yeah, they get, yeah, we got a family, right? So according statistically, you are of the 1% most wealthiest people in the world. So this applies to you. And to me, command those who are rich in this present age, that's you guys, not to be haughty, that's puffed up, that's prideful, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but to trust in who? The living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let me tell you something, what I'm about to tell you today, okay? Nothing in what I'm saying is God wants you to be this ho-hum believer walking around in defeat and, oh, 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 you know, I'm, I'm humbling myself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be poor it's not what God says. He says he gives these things to you to enjoy. He gives you this life to enjoy. But don't forget, matter of fact, there's a scripture in the text. I don't remember what the uh, chapter and verse is. But it says that once you have enjoyed this stuff, don't forget to come back to God and thank him. Because he gave it to you. Let them do good. That's you guys. That's us. Let us do good that we may be rich in good works. Ready to give. Willing to share. Right? Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. What time to come? The eternal life. The life to come. The kingdom of God that's coming, right? That they may lay hold on eternal life. See, God's saying, look. See, the sign of maturity in the Hebrew culture wasn't about how much money or knowledge they had or how often they went to church, which as a pastor, I'm saying, keep coming to church. It's a good thing. Because we do grow mature. But he wasn't saying that your maturity is based on that. It was mature. The Hebrew culture was how generous you were. The good works that you performed. That was the measure that they would look at and go, there's something different in this person. And the same thing goes with us. Because today we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And all the Holy Spirit's job is to lead us into good works. Why? Not to give us glory and let us be patted on the back and look how spiritual we are. It was done so that people would glorify God. Like, I used to know this cat before he got saved. I used to know Mike, what he was before he got saved. But now look at his life. Look how, look how generous he is. Look how generous he is. We're going to talk about a little bit deeper into this, into understanding this Hebrew culture, because here's the thing. I think it still applies today. That how generous are you? Now, I know before some of y'all just think about money here, and I know some of y'all got them, the cash register. All you hear is ching, 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 ching. All right, and you shut out because you're thinking, oh, Pastor Mike's going to take up a love offering at the head and serve. We're not. I don't take up offerings, never have to. Well, I've taken up maybe twice for emergency situations for someone else that was in our church that needed it. Never for our church. But here's the thing. We need to have a generous spirit. Why do I say that? Well, because no one here would consider themselves a selfish person. At least I hope you wouldn't. We don't like to admit that. Even if we are selfish, we wouldn't get up on the platform and go, my name's Mike and I'm selfish. Okay, we don't do that. Right? We just, we just, we're too selfish to do that. So the opposite of generosity, though, and, and there's no way you can move around it, but the opposite of generosity is selfishness. It's selfishness. When we live out of our flesh, the fruit of living out of our flesh, watch this, hang on. I know it's going to hurt. Pick up your toes if you want me to. But the living out of flesh is selfishness. But God makes a way for us, and when we walk in the Spirit, and we live a supernatural life that's committed to the kingdom, it is done through generosity. An easy way to remember it is like this way. We are born in the flesh like little babies, right? 
selfish. You were born as a baby. All right? I'm looking at these three boys. No one had to teach them four-letter word, not the one you're thinking of, but it starts with an M. Mine. No one teaches a child mine. All of a sudden, they're in the room with their, their sibling, and they're fighting over a toy, and all you hear is, Mine! And you want to go in there because it runs right up the back side of you, right? And over your curb. And you know it's not really there because you paid for it, right? And you want to go in there and grab his little nappy neck, shake him a little bit and go, no, mine. <laughs> right? That's what we all want to do. Come on, let's just be real at church today, okay? Real people. That's what we are. Real love, real people, right? You don't have to teach them that. Why? Because in the flesh, we are selfish. But now watch this. When you are born again as a believer in Christ and you're following Jesus and your body, your mind and everything has been renewed, the Bible says that all things become new, you're born again generous. There's a great way to measure your spiritual maturity. If you're still selfish in areas of your life, you haven't redeemed those areas over to the Father. And the areas that you have been generous, you've been given those over to the Father. And the one that we tend to hang on the most happens to be our income. Now, we know generosity deals with multiple areas, but here, look at this story to prove my point. Is a great example of this story is a dude that I can relate to very, very well, and so can Cecil back there on the camera, and that is a guy named Zacchaeus. How many of y'all know who Zacchaeus was? He was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, all right? I don't know that he was that tall, but the Bible says that he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord was passing by, and he wanted to see him, right? Jesus sees him in, the, in, in there, sees his faith that he's reaching out to see the Lord, and he calls him down and says, Zacchaeus, today salvation's coming to your home. I'm coming to your house. I'm going to come eat with you. So you get this great story, right? And so he was a tax collector. Now, you might think today, we still don't, anybody like tax collectors in this room? Anybody? You like tax collectors? Oh, okay, praise God. Thank you, man. I appreciate that, man. So nobody in this room, like IRS, all right, they come collect everything. And I don't know how they have that power, but they do. Well, it was even worse in their time. Matter of fact, when Jesus is describing people that are out of relationship with him, he says sinners and, right, tax collectors. He, he put sinners above the tax collectors. Because, here's what's crazy, especially with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was Jewish. And he was working for the Roman government. And he was taxing Jewish people. So he didn't really have a great uh, reputation. And yet, Jesus does something in his life. And, and watch what happens when he encounters Yeshua. Watch what happens. Luke chapter 19, verse 8. Watch. This is awesome. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore it fourfold. See, he had an encounter with Jesus. And when he had an encounter with Jesus, not only was he repentant by giving back what he had taken, he went into a mode of generosity and said, whatever I've done, I'm going to four times that. That's the attitude of generosity. That's the life change that happens in the heart of a believer. We got to get this this morning. See, when we have an encounter with our Messiah, selfishness begins to die and generosity is born. It is the law of what we call the law of eternal rewards. The law of eternal rewards. And that means that everything I do, especially in the area of a generous life, stores up or robs from that eternal account. So you're either building up that account or you're withdrawing from that account to where it's depleted. This is what Scripture teaches. This is what God said to do, to build up for yourselves treasure where? In the kingdom, how do we do that? By generous living, by living a life. You know, you've heard it said, I know, you know, there's a country song, there's not enough month at the end of the check or not enough check at the end of the month, I'm not sure. Uh, do what? Month at the end of the money. You know what my son listens to, praise God. All right, <laughs> somebody told on. they're like, I'm not saying it. All right, too much month at the end of the money. How many of y'all been there, praise God, right? But God says, man, I can stretch it. I was just talking to a family in our church and I didn't get their permission, so I'm not going to mention their name. But what they were telling me is the same story that I hear over and over and over again. And that is, before they understood tithe and giving and doing what God said, living this generous life, they were in a financial struggle. And they said something that most people say when they get a hold of this. Let's just test God on this. Let's just try it. 
Because I know if we try it, God will bless us. And they did. And they didn't make any more money. I talked to another young woman just a few weeks ago, and, and they were telling us uh, her husband is, is not a believer, and they come to church, but he's not really into this tithing thing or this giving thing. But she is. And she gives what God has commanded her to give, and she does what God has commanded her to do, and she just got a, a very substantial, I was going to say the amount, but I don't want to because it might let, her, let us know who she is, a very substantial raise. And her husband just got a brand new job making well over what they were making before. And I loved what her response was. She said she said to him, she said, do you know why this happened? <laughs> Praise God. Because his response is a lot of what other people's response was. It's like, why are you giving to the church? Why do you give that money to Pastor Mike? Why do you, it's not to me, by the way. If you did not know that, read your scriptures. Um, giving wasn't from Pastor Mike. Giving's for you. It's for you to enter into a place that God wants to reward you. And that is what we're going to talk about is enter the tithe. What is tithe? Tithe is simple. Tithe in the Hebrew equals tenth. That's all it means. It means tenth. Right? Tithe is a tenth of all your increase, the Bible says. And I love this because the tithe, some of this is going to be a revelation for you. The Bible calls it. Remember we were talking about that word holy a minute ago? The Bible says that the tithe is holy. What's holy mean? So if it's set apart, it's set apart for who? Come on, somebody. It's set apart. No, no, not us. It's set apart for God. That's correct. So anything that God sanctifies is holy. That means it's set apart for Him. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to Him. We see this first in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. It says, Thus, all the tithe, say all, all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is whose? It's the Lord's. And it's holy to the Lord. Now, you might say, well, Pastor Mike, that's the Old Testament. Well, I think we've established that enough in our church, what this means when we talk about the Old Testament. All right? In other words, the Bible says that the tenth of everything is set apart for God. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Him. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says it this way. It says for us to honor God. The Lord. How do we honor God with our possessions? With the first fruits of all your increase. Why? Look. So your barns will be filled with plenty. This is God's promise to us. God doesn't need your money. He offers you, just like in everything in life, He offers you a condition to a promise. And He says that if you'll trust me in this... Bring it into the house so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. It's powerful. So many of us are struggling financially, but this is the area that you've got to get because the way you defeat selfishness is by giving. There's no other way to beat selfishness than by giving. It's the only way that it works. God's word commands us that the burden, even with all of his commands that he gives us, they, these weren't designed, the law of God and the commands of God were never meant to be a burden to weigh us down that we've got to wake up in the morning going, oh God, oh God, what am I going to do? I don't know if I can do this. Because watch what he says in 1 John 5, 3. He says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his what? His commands, and his commands are not what? See, God's commands and the things that he's told us to do were never created to be a burden. I said this to someone as we were studying this. I said, the only reason why it becomes a burden, and, and hear my heart, is because in our spirit, we're rebellious to it. And when our heart has that spirit of rebellion, it becomes something that is hard for us to do. Because we're in the selfish state. And when you're in a selfish state, it is hard for us to understand, oh, wh why does God want to do this? God gives us the opportunity to give because he wants you to be able to make it through this area that we tend to fight against in every area of our life, and it's selfishness. And even when, finally, now I've talked to people and they say, well, Pastor Mike, I give at the church, you know, I, I serve, you know, I come to the church and I, and I do this and I do that. That's not tithing. Tithing requires a commitment to you. And it comes out of the part that hurts us the most. Right here. Or if you carry that, that the weighted thing that y'all carry around. Some of y'all carry the luggage, luggage rack that y'all carry with you. Praise God. See, many of us still not think this is for today. And no, Pastor Mike, this is Old Testament. 
or that it was done away with the law. Well, hopefully by now you know that the law never got done away with. Jesus never said that. Matthew 3, I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Go read that on your own. And this is how God views the tithe, and this is how God wants to bless you. Here it is right here. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. Watch. Will a man rob God? That is, first of all, just that statement alone, kind of like, I'm not the smartest tool in the shed or sharpest. That blows my mind. How could, even, how, how could you rob God? But he says, you have robbed me. Uh, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? And he says two things. He says, in tithes and what? In offerings. Remember, this is a gateway we're trying to get to, okay? I got to go through the ugly stuff for a moment to get through the blessing. You are cursed with a curse. How many of y'all want to be cursed? Now, I've talked to people that say, well, Jesus removed the curse. Yes, he removed the curse of the law by becoming a curse on the tree. But when you don't do what God says, listen to me in this, you put yourself back into the curse. Willfully. You willfully put yourself back under the curse. Yes, we are delivered from the curse. You are cursed for the curse, for you have robbed me. Even, he says, the whole nation. Well, we know at this time, the whole nation was affected by this. Now, we know, you know, we were talking about this, uh, Justin and I were talking about this, that we know, you know, the whole nation of Israel, that's a lot of, they weren't all robbing God. But because the majority of them were, the whole nation was under a curse. See, that goes back to what I made the point with last Sunday, that when you are walking in the blessing, it is not just about you. It affects everybody that you are around. Your blessed life, your gen that God wants to do in your life, affects the, the, the friends you go to school with, the people you work with, your equipment, come on somebody, your business, it affects everything. Because that's the way God created it. So the whole nation was... So here's the thing. You have to get this in your spirit this morning. This is what tithe is. Tithing is a test. It's a test to see if you will pass. It's a test that God says, I'm going to put before you life and death. Like we talked about that last Sunday. Life and death I set before you. I'm saying you want to pass the test. You, and it's a test of whether or not you're going to be selfish or you're going to trust God in the area. And you get this test. For some of you, you get this test every month. Some of y'all get it twice, twice a month. Sometimes you get it four times, depending on how you uh, receive your resources, your, 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 your finances. So we're tested every time. It's a test. It's a test of whether or not you are going to trust the Father with everything that He has given to you. Malachi 3.10, He tells us what? Bring, here it is, here's the test. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this. There's the test. Try me now in this. And see, says the Lord, if I will not open for you. Here's, the, here's how you know you pass the test. For you, the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, I don't know about y'all. I still have a little bit of room. Come on, somebody. Right? How many of y'all got a little bit more room, right? Right? Some of y'all have a lot of room because you're not doing the test. You haven't passed the test yet. This is huge that we get this in our spirit. Now, I, I put a scripture in here because I want you to see that, that, that this curse and financial giving and everything, Yeshua teaches us to do it. It's not just the Old Testament. Matter of fact, let's take a look in the book of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 23. Look at this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He is speaking to the religious folks of the time. Now, what they were really good at is following the law. Right? And the law said they were supposed to tithe. They did tithe. But watch what he says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. In other words, these were high dollar spices. Right? And have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice and mercy and faith. Now, these you ought to have done. You need to highlight that part in your Bible. Do you see that? These you ought to have done without, what? Leaving the others undone. In other words, you should have still tithed on this, but you should not have neglected this. He wasn't saying get rid of the tithe. Matter of fact, Jesus, we follow Jesus. We're supposed to be obedient to what Jesus told us to do. And we're supposed to be living out this life in doing what he told us to do. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. A person who claims to be continuing in union with him, this is Jesus, ought to conduct his life how? The way he did. So we're going to follow Jesus. Everything that Jesus did, that's what we're instructed to do. And he paid tithes. Y'all remember the story of Peter? He's like, hey, they're telling us that we got to pay this tax, right? So he tells them what? Go in the water, get you a coin out of a fish's mouth. First fish you get. Now, that would be miraculous in and of itself. 
Right? He says, go fishing, which we know Jesus is awesome because he told Peter to go fishing. All right? And I like going fishing. He went fishing. He said, pull out a coin out of the first fish that you, you, you caught. He does. He brings it back to Jesus. He says, whose inscription is on this? Now watch what he says. He says, Caesar's. He said, therefore, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and do what? Give unto the Lord that which is the Lord's. What we were talking about. We're talking about money. Right? And he tells Peter right there, you give to what belongs to them to them. But you bring unto the Lord what belongs to the Lord. Why? Because God wants to bless you. He doesn't want money to be an issue for you. He doesn't want that to be an issue. Now, I want you to notice two things in our past scripture. I'm going to go back here just a quick second. It says, Yeshua did not say not to tithe, first of all. And then he added to that. He said, not only do you tithe, but you also should do this. This is what I think is about offering. All right? Last week, we spoke about how that our obedience blesses other people. Your obedience, man, is not about being like trapped in legalism and all this other stuff. It's so that we can be a bigger blessing. Remember, we're set apart. Our lives are different. We should look and act and behave differently. Malachi chapter 3, 11 through 12. Watch. And I will rebuke. This is what God's going to do because we're obedient and we're being tested every month and we, get, we pass our test. And when we pass our test, this is what his promise is. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Now, I want to stop there for just a second. And I want to ask you the question, what is devouring your finances? Think about that for a moment. What is it that's devouring your finances? And some of you guys, I just seen you look over at your wife. That's not what you're supposed to do. Praise God. All right. And why stop looking at your husband? More parts, right? We need more truck parts. Come on, somebody. I'm sorry, dude. I had to go there. I had to make it equal. I had to be fair on both sides, okay? So we're looking at, he, he says, I'll rebuke the devourer. What is your devourer? Matter of fact, I looked up that word devourer, a beautiful word in the Hebrew. It means what's eating it up. What's eating up your finances? Well, the Bible says that when I tithe and I'm obedient to that, the Bible says that God will rebuke whatever's eating up my finances. And people that are tithing right now, you know this, you've seen this in your life. You've seen it. And God says, this is because of my will. So, and I will rebuke the devourer so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Watch this. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field. In other words, whatever you have that God's blessing or whatever's out there that you're doing, it says that whatever you do, and if you're, in this case, he's using the, the fruit of the vine, it says it will produce fruit. Your job, your family, maybe that extra hobby, maybe you've got a little side hustle going on. God says, I'll bless that. And here's what I love. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations, say all. That means everybody around you. Anytime you see the word nations, watch this, it's referring to Gentile believers or Gentile people, right? Gentile people. Anytime you see nations in Scripture, it's dealing with people that do not have covenant with God. People that are outside the covenant relationship that you have because of Jesus. So anytime you see that, it's really the word is either heathen. Some of you all heathen, right? Praise God. Some of you all southern folks, you say heathen. It's a heathen or non-believers that don't have covenant. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delight where? In the land. Who gets blessed when you do what God says to do? Everyone. Somebody said it over here. That's right. Everyone gets blessed. You stepping in tithe is bigger than just you and your bank account. It's everything that God has put you to be in charge of. Right? It puts you to be in charge. Man, I am making great time. You guys are going to get out early maybe. I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I'm, I apologize. Praise God, right? Now, in this area of tithing, and what God says in Malachi, there's two areas I want to cover, and I'm going to wrap it up with this. Number one is, we said tithe. Tithe belongs to who? God. So whoever said God, you're correct. Anybody who didn't say anything, you're wrong. Okay? Tithe belong to Him. You can't borrow from tithe. You can't come up and say, I'm going to give you a fifth of a tenth. That doesn't know how it works. All right? The tenth belongs to him, period. Now, here's the cool thing. And that's the other thing that he talked about in that verse in Malachi, and that is offerings. Offerings. Now, I'm going to cover these real quick because I want you to make sure you get it. One is voluntary and one is commanded. Okay? The tithe is which one? Commanded. Thank you, guys. Amen. Tithe is commanded, not an option. But the offering is voluntary. Now, this is how I tell people when they talk to me about this. They'll say, well, Pastor Mike, I give a, a non, I know some of y'all, and I'm not trying to pick on you, hear my heart. I give anonymously on Sundays, and you are giving what we call an offering. The problem with that, though, is if you haven't tithed first, guess what? That offering has no power. Now, watch this. 
If you're tithing and you have offering, the offering, I want you to get this, is seed. Say seed. seed. That means if you need a harvest in your life, it doesn't come from the tithe. God blesses you because of it. But the seed that produces a harvest of your life comes from the seed that, God, that you give to God. And that's in offering. So that's a voluntary, willing gift that you give to anybody. It doesn't have to be in church. It could be outside the church. It could be the homeless guy down on the street. It doesn't matter. When you voluntarily give, the Bible calls that an offering. And the Bible says in Malachi, we just read it, that we were robbing him in which? Come on. Both. In the tithe and in the offering. Because they all belong to him, but you're blessing others. Now watch. I love this. God wants you and I to be cheerful givers of everything that he has given to us. He's our father. We are to imitate him. See, when you take on the image of your daddy, Heavenly Father, you should act like your daddy, right? They should be able to look at you and go, man, you act just like your daddy. You're so blessed, right? Not your earthly daddy, but your Heavenly Father. God wants us to act like him. He's generous. How do we know that? For God so loved the world that he gave. He loves you. He loves us. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 8, Paul makes a mention to the Corinthian church. And a lot of people will take this out and they'll go, up, oh, see, we're not supposed to tithe. But you've got to understand context. When you read scripture, don't just, don't be cherry pickers. All right? You know, you know what a cherry picker is? Find one verse in the middle of 50, 100 verses and go, up, oh, see, well, this is what God says. No. Be, learn to read scripture through context. In other words, who's he talking to? Why is he saying it? Who's he talking about? Paul here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 through 8 says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. What are we talking about? Are we talking about tithe? Or are we talking about offering? We're talking about offering, that's correct. Because see, he was talking to the Corinthian church because he had just came out of Macedonia. And in there, they had get, taken up a large collection, an offering for him. So that he could continue to do the work of ministry. We're not talking about tithe, we're talking about an offering. Right? But watch what he says about the offering. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Let me put it like this. All right? This is how Rob and I learned about offering. If you give a thimbleful, the Bible says, guaranteed, you'll receive in a thimbleful. If you give in a truckload, God's promise is he'll return it back to you in a truckload. This is why we call it seed. The measure that you give is the measure that it comes back to you. And let me tell you a little secret on this. This is about every area of your life. It can be in your gift your talent, or your treasure. This is huge. But I say to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Right? So let each one give as he, what? Purposes in his heart. That's up to you. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, you do not give because Pastor Mike preached a method series. We're not talking about tithe. Tithe belongs to dad, right? We're talking about offering. You don't do it because Pastor Mike just preached a message on it. You do it because God is, you're, you've been transformed and you have a generous spirit inside you and you're looking like your father and you're acting like your heavenly father. So therefore we give. Verse eight says, and God is, I love this. God is able to make all, what? What is the definition of grace? Unearned favor. You see that? When you give, he says that God is able to make all unearned favor abound toward you that you, Say me. Always having all sufficiency in all things and have an abundance of every good work. And if you actually read down through more of that verses, what you're going to find, it, which is so cool, is that it even says that when your heart is turned towards him, he'll even give you the seed to plant. He'll even give you the offering. You're like, God, I want to give this. And God, my heart is towards this. And he goes, okay, I'll make a way. And you'll, all of a sudden you'll wake up and you're like, yeah, maybe a, a, a random check comes in the mail and you weren't even expecting. You're like, oh my gosh, now I have the seed to sow into this. Read the rest of the verse. Read it on your own. It's powerful. He said that he will provide the seed to the sower. So if you become a sower in your offerings, God says he'll provide that for you. It doesn't even have to come out of your own bank account. Come on, somebody. That's good preaching. I don't know about you. That was good preaching right there. I mean, that, I would, I'm preaching myself happy. Praise God. Come on. All right. Let's round this thing up. All right. Luke chapter 11, 33 through 36, our final scripture. As we get ready to wrap this thing up, I got a couple of minutes. Everybody's looking at the clock going, really? Two minutes? Come on. All right. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body of the eye, and therefore when your eye is good, say good. Very important if you have a physical Bible, 
highlight good, circle it, point arrows to it, whatever you want to do. Your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, everybody say bad. Circle it, highlight it, do something, whatever you need, point arrows to it. Your body also is full of darkness. Now therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the light shines of a lamp gives you light. Now let me under, give you, under, this is called, for some of you Bible thumpers, it is called a Hebrew idiom. Say idiom. Not idiot, idiom. Make sure you understand the two, okay? Now what a Hebrew idiom is like something we say like kick the bucket. Right, we got things that we say that a Hebrew idiom is very similar. And so if you don't know this, you're going to read that scripture like most people read and think they're talking about good and evil. If you're a good person, you're a good person. If you're an evil person, you're evil. It's not what it's talking about. Because you actually go back and read context in Matthew and here, you'll see above it and below it, it's talking about money. This is dealing with generosity. He's saying that if, you, if your eye is good, in other words, you are a generous person, then your whole body is filled with good. But if you are selfish, it's relating it to darkness. And here's what I love about it. Because, man, you can, like, branch out from this. And he says, if you're full of light, then your whole body is full of light. Can you imagine a church body that is filled with generous people? Then we're all light. And then our body is filled with light. That's the power of generosity. It's the power of generosity. This isn't talking about whether you're good or bad. This is talking about whether you're generous or whether you are selfish. It's a Hebrew idiom. You guys can go study it on your own. Try to prove Pastor Mike wrong. I love it when you guys do that. Come on, do it, and let's see what happens. So here's the challenge today. If you're tithing, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to trust God beyond the tithe and become a generous person. Or maybe you're here today and you don't tithe. You thought that was old school, Old Testament stuff. I hate the terminology Old Testament because it makes it think, seem like that's done away with. That's why we call it the Tanakh, the Pentateuch, the, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. It's commanded on us to do this. We don't get to option. We don't get to decide. But what we do get to decide is whether or not we want God's blessing on our life. And part of it is in your finances. Some of you guys are struggling in finances and all God's saying is, you've got to trust me with this. Isn't it interesting, guys, that we will trust God with our soul of going to heaven or going to hell, but we won't trust him with our money? Mind blown. The thing that we cannot take away with us when we leave is the one thing that we'll hold on to so tight that can actually keep us from living out the life that God created. Or you'll keep someone else from living out the life they were created. Because you think that tithe is not for you. It's for me, it's for you, it's for every person who calls on the name of Jesus. Why? It's a test. And God wants you to pass this test. Young people, your jobs, same thing. No one's excluded from this. We all are submitted to this. Why? So we can receive the blessing of the Lord. Y'all stand to your feet. I want to pray for you. And then I'm going to bring my brother up here. And he's going to... A couple of announcements, I think, right? I want you to be blessed. You are not tithe. I'm going to tell you this. Epic Life Church doesn't need your money. God has provided for us and he always has and he always will. But this isn't about Epic Life Church. This is about you. And this is about what God wants to do in your finances. And this is what he promised in his scripture. That if you'll be obedient, this is the result of your obedience. He wants you blessed. Because you're set apart. You are holy unto him. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around this morning. First and foremost, I want to pray for you. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you've not turned your life to him. Would you please do it today? Would you please do it today? I'm begging you. Take this serious. Eternity is forever. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand? Let me pray for you this morning. Say, Pastor Mike, I want to make a decision to follow Christ. Anybody here today? Anybody? Amen. Then I want to pray for you. Maybe you're struggling with your finances. Maybe it's time. And you're like, man, this is, this is going to be tough. It is, but you've got to trust God. You've got to trust God. If that's you this morning, I want to pray for you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you struggle with the tithe, would you just lift up your hand? I'm not taking notes. I'm not writing your name down, okay? Praise God. I see you, brother. I see you in the back. I see you up front. I see you girls up front. Thank you so much. Man, thank you for that boldness. I know that's tough. So let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, help me to trust you. 
to do as your word says to do so that the windows of heaven would be opened up and pour a blessing on me and my home that I cannot contain. In the name of Jesus, amen. Trust him with the tithe, trust him with your offering and watch God 